Head to head still at the 316s par. Imaginaire and Kelly Francois. Learn horse racing with Kelly Francois. A peek over the shoulder of the world's best horse racing experts as they handicap a horse race. Hosted by Kelly Francois, professional racehorse jockey and handicapping analyst for the historic Pimlico Racecourse and Laurel Racetrack of the Maryland Jockey Club. To them, what a day for them and what a great ride by Sheldon. Hello, everybody. I am Callie Francois, and welcome to Learn Horse Racing, where we take a peek over the shoulder of the top horse players in the world as they handicap a race. A deep dive into the details as experts really show us their work, their techniques, and all the handicapping tools they use. This week, we are honored to have Andy Serling renowned TV analyst and handicapper for the New York Racing Association. A true lover of the game, Andy will always give you the call it as he sees the style, but will also leave no stone unturned. Let's see what we can learn from Andy, guys. Let's get into it. We are in the room with Andy Serling. Andy, a pleasure to have you here on with us today. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Let's just get right into things. Uh, First of all, before we even touch on uh, the race that we're about to get into, just overall, how would you describe yourself as a handicapper? What's your main handicapping philosophy? I, I think that people pigeonhole themselves or get pigeonholed by other people. And I, I, I'd say that my philosophy is to try to find the situation that the race dictates. I mean, I think there are so many different factors and in handicapping and you know one thing is to to never just disregard a horse without at least making sure you've you've, you've taken a real look at the horse to decide but i i mean i i believe that speed figures are important but they're they're, they're one of the tools in, in handicapping i think looking at trips trying to come up with a, an idea of how a race may set up and how it may help or hurt different competitors but I, i'd like to think i'm somebody that tries to keep an open mind about races um, before you handicap them, because I think when you go into a race saying, oh, I know I like so-and-so, you're going to have a biased and jaundiced view of looking at it. And the, the less we can do it, and we all have our biases. We've all been around the track a long time and there's trainers or horses or jockeys that we may like more than other ones, but try to keep that as much at bay as you can. Diving into it deeper, what are the main tools that you use? And I would love to hear how you describe those tools uh, in your own words. Well, I mean, I, 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 I use PPs and I just I sort of scan the PPs to try to give myself an overview of a race. So any race, I start out by just going through the field and seeing if I have to look up information, what kind of information. I, I use Daily Race Forms Formulator. I think it's the single greatest invention in horse racing in my lifetime. Um, inside the PPs on Formulator, you can take them apart. You can look at the charts, see who horses ran against see how the race were run, take a look at the day's card if you want to, and which is especially valuable for shippers, um, something that we have a lot, especially when we get to Saratoga, but even when we get back at, at Belmont, you know, in, in the spring, because we're been in Florida or Oakland or Keeneland. So I use that a lot. And I look at replays. I, I want to watch races again. I don't take a lot of notes on races really that I watch because A, I remember things, but B, I'd rather have a fresh look at them because while I'm doing handicapping to try to come up with ideas about races and, and, and try to pick winners, whatever that's worth. But more importantly, I mean, a lot of my work is being on television and talking about races, which I know you understand. So a lot of the work I'm doing is also for being on the air and presenting information. Formulator, you can look up trainer stats, which I find a little bit useful in handicapping. I don't think you ever want to bet a horse because of a trainer stat. But, you know, I think good trainer stats are, are, are good for long shots. Bad trainer stats for short priced horses is a general rule of thumb. I also use Timeform US to look at the pace figures and um, also their pace projector. Their pace projector is their idea based on horses' pace figures of where they, how they think the race is going to be run, a lot of speed, little speed, where horses figure to be. Give myself an idea, look at that, sort of try to determine if I agree, disagree, why would I disagree? And also the Timeform US figures are, are they're, they're somewhat theoretically linear towards the buyer figures where they're like, 15, 20 points higher. 
And I like to look at them to see if there's a big discrepancy between a figure they have and buyer has. It may be that it's a pace related number. They may have seen the race differently. And it gives me an idea of looking at both figures and thinking, why did two different figure makers, two people who I greatly respect, Greg Mulkowski and, and people who work with Andy Beyer, um, but you know, why do they come to different conclusions and, and try to draw my own conclusions based on that. So I think time form sets off well with, with Formulator and what DRF has to offer. Um, I also, I do the, the track trends for our, our website where they're the daily bias stuff, my ideas on how race days cards played. And I, I access those, I have those open to my computer. So I access you know, different days to see if there was a bias. So many days are just fair. So I'll, I'll, I'll look up things like that. And, you know, I'll look at replays. I, I use Naira bets where I, where I bet, um, but also we have all the replays you could want, not just in this country, you know, tracks for, for CDI, which aren't available um, in a lot of places. We have those European rates as well, which is always valuable when the Breeders' Cup comes around. So I, I use those for replays. And listen, I mean, at this time of year in New York, I probably watch four to eight replays for a card. In the, in the summer, Saratoga, I can watch 15 or 20 because there's a lot more shippers, different things to look at. But I let the, the race and the card tell me what I want to look up. So when you do look up replays, are you often looking at what goes wrong as, as far as, you know, the type of trip, if they come into issues, or are you kind of looking at where that horse fits and where that horse likes to be in the field with extenuating circumstances? I think it's all those things to a certain extent. I, I, I mean, I, as far as if I was going to give my thoughts on, on trip handicapping as it is, I think people greatly overrate trouble. You know, okay. They'll see a horse has a little bit of trouble in a race and they'll say, oh, that horse had a terrible trip. Right. Well, you have to take the whole trip into to, to consideration. Take a race where a horse breaks a little slowly, a turf race where it has an outside post and a two-turn race and breaks a little slowly and the jockey's able to get over the rail fairly effectively. That might have been a good thing, <laughs> you know. Right. Riders might wish they could do the Euro Rider. So you understand this. Wish they could. I mean, it's, you can't. It's you know, it's not. You're not driving a car. You can't sort of stop them and get out what you want. But if you could, you know, get left a little and get over the rail more easily, so maybe it helped them. So you say, oh, that horse got left. Well, did it hurt him or help them? Or maybe the pace got so quick that the fact the horse broke a little slowly didn't really matter because the pace heated up so much. The race was run in a very favorable manner for that horse. Um, but also, I think you want to have an idea going in, where did I think this horse would be placed? Did something happen at the break that completely changed where this horse was placed, but also the way the race was run? Suppose I liked the horse, I thought there was gonna be a bunch of speeds. And as it turned out, one or two of the speeds got left or there was some trouble and the pace didn't develop the way you thought it would. So you had a closer that was compromised. So, I mean, I think you wanna look at a lot of things. How was the race run? As you say, was the horse behind horses? I mean, I think that, one of the catchphrases that's gotten big in the last two, three years is kickback. And it kind of yeah. annoys me because okay. I think that as horses get older and feel free to disagree with this, um, you ride horses, you have much more experience in this than I do. Most horses will get more used to kickback and dirt over time. I think a first time starter taking kickback could be really interesting. But if a horse has run 20 times and it gets some kickback, okay, maybe, and some kickback situations are worse. I think Saratoga, we had some pretty harsh kickback this summer, which kind of hindered closers. I don't think it was a biased track. I think the, the closers were hindered by kickback. Um, but in a general sense, I don't want to overuse kickback as, a, as an excuse. But I do think you want to keep yourself open to that. Why do horses spin their wheels be, behind horses on the inside and the dirt much more than they do on the outside? Maybe it's kickback related. Maybe horses are more comfortable moving outside. But I think you want to watch a race in whole and not just look for trouble. But, you know, did the horse get a trip that it was comfortable with? Correct. So that's, you know, you look at when a horse gets a trip that's comfortable with and you kind of take that within the overall picture of the horse and go forward from there. Am yeah. I getting you correctly? Yeah, I mean, in other words, as the race was run, did something happen in the race that hindered this horse from running its better race? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you'll watch and say, you know what? Not really. You know, a lot of trips, a lot of races, you know, things with horses, not much happens. They're just not good enough to win. Correct. Um, you know, I, but I think you have to learn to evaluate two things well. One, did a horse overperform because it had very favorable circumstances? And vice versa, did a horse underperform because it had unfavorable circumstances? And then you have to look at today's race. 
and say, does it rate to have those kind of favorable or unfavorable circumstance today? Or perhaps the situation will be reversed. Today with Andy, we are handicapping the sixth race at Aqueduct. This is a $62,000 optional claimer, non-winners of two other than. It is a 10 horse field, a one turn mile on the dirt on December 31st, 2021. So we've got our formulator open where formulator is the first thing that you typically look at. So what's the first thing that you look at when you're looking at formulator? Now, are you, are, do you, are you a guy who throws out contenders? I don't think you are from what you previously said. Uh, what's the first thing that you're looking at? Well, I mean, I don't use formulator first. I'm putting it up to the PPs. The first thing I do is I make a run through um, with a blue pen. Horse to horse to horse, I'll run down the whole set of PPs for the race. It's the sixth race on Friday on New Year's Eve at, at Aqueduct. And I go through each horse making notations to myself. Do I want to look up a trainer stack? For instance, Mexican Wonder Boy, the horse on the rail. Um, this horse is claimed by Linda Rice, who's was also claimed from Danny Gargan. I want to look up stats. Formula, I can look up stats. How do horses do their claim from Danny Gargan on the dirt? I'll look those up. I'll see how does Linda Rice do off the claim. Look up things like that. Um, just make some notes. What I want to look up about what Mexican Wonder Boy's last race is, okay, he had speed and he was right on top of the pace. It looks on paper like it was a pretty quick pace. Now, I don't know that that was the case, but look at the final time, mm -hmm. 138.03, and they went the half in 45.53. So the first half went in 45 and three fifths, and the second half went in um, <clears throat> 54, I'm sorry, 52 and two fifths. Mm -hmm. So clearly the pace beginning was early. Now aqueduct track, it slows down the farther they go. So it's a factor of that too, but it does feel like a fast pace. So I want to look up, how did the horses that finished behind Mexican Wonder Boy do? How are the other speeds? He was third, length off early. How did the horses that were first and second? Where did they finish? So that's something I note to myself, look that race up. And I'm going to go back, when I go back to formulator and I'm going to look that race up. Then I go to the second horse, who's boldish. And okay, it's also Linda Rice. Now, immediately I'm thinking, Linda Rice has two in here. Is she going to run both of them? Because she does scratch a lot of horses, and you have to keep that in mind. But let's assume for this argument, she'll run them both. Okay, boldish has won three races in a row. He's also run against a five-horse field, a six-horse field, and a four-horse field. And today he's in a 10-horse field. I don't, I know, I don't need to look up the races that he's run. I know the horses he was running against were inferior. So I've already made a sort of mental point to myself. Okay, he's coming out of three wins, but people like to bet horses off wins, but this is a much tougher race. Then I go to the third horse, Lost in Rome. I think, well, when Lost in Rome was good, he had speed. He doesn't really have that speed anymore, and he's not running his best figures. And I did a quick look at him, and I don't really have much to say about him, nothing to look up. He finished third behind Mexican Wonder Boy. Seems like he probably had an easier trip last time out. Mm -hmm. Then I go to buy land and see. And the interesting thing about this horse is he's never run the dirt. And so I'm going to look up his pedigree. Is this a horse that has pedigree that says he should be able to handle the dirt? For whatever reason, his trainers have never wanted to run the dirt. Tur not usually a good sign. Tony Dutter didn't want to ship to Florida. He left the horse in New York. He wants to find out. Should I let this horse winter and, you know, take the winter off? Or should I run him on the dirt? Mm -hmm. So I want to look up his pedigree. Then I come to prioritize. And I think, hmm. I want to look up that day, November 28th, because I think there was a bias that day. So I want to look that up because I know empty tomb wired the field. And normally I might want to watch the replay of his race, but I actually remember he was on the rail that day. So I write a note down that I want to look up what was the bias for November 28th. Then I come to untreated. And clearly I see this Todd Pletcher horse that won his return race, the 96 buyer, I remember this horse. He was a very highly touted Chad Brown horse for owner Paul Pompa, who was sold in dispersal after Paul unfortunately passed away. And this was a very, very heavily touted horse. And he obviously has a lot of ability. And I think I've now I've seen the favorite. And as a handicapper, I think one of the most important things you're going to have to do in every single race is understand how you feel about the favorite. So I realized that untreated is the one this race is going to go through. Now, maybe I'm going to have a reason I don't like him. 
but I know who he is. I've identified the favorite. We'll move on. Then there's 235. I look at him. I don't see anything particularly conclusive about him to look up. I can look up who he ran against, but his last race was Mahoning Valley in a four horse field. So I'll make a notation to look up and formulate who he ran against in case there happened to be three other killers that showed up from other racetracks, but it's not really very likely. Then you go to parsimony, and I'm going to say something at the risk of offending. Um, Danny Gargan trains his horse, and he's riding a 10-pound bug rider. I believe this is also a woman rider. I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. You having been a 10-pound rider and a woman rider, I don't mean to offend you, but I think you also might agree that a trainer like Danny Gargan, who's a high-percentage trainer, I wonder to myself, is Danny Gargan putting on a 10-pound bug rider on a horse that he really loves? She is riding a number of horses for them. She probably gallops horses in the morning, may have, a, may have a relationship with the barn. You know, all those things are fine, but we're still saying Danny Gargan is riding this rider and Danny Gargan wins a lot. Trainer, you know, jockey agent want to ride for him. So I say to myself, here's a horse that was in good form once that ran once for Danny Gargan coming in from California and ran horrendously at even money at parks in a Pennsylvania bred race. Hard to be overly optimistic. Right. Trevor McCarthy rode this horse last time. So I'm skeptical. Then I come to Pioneer Spirit, a once good horse who seems to have clearly lost his form. He is off the claim for Mertan Cantor Masi, a trainer I know is good off the claim, but I'll know. Claim for Robertino Diodoro. I can look up the stats on how horses do claim for Robertino Diodoro, but I know not very well. And finally, I come to Croatian on the outside, who is off a layoff off the claim for, Dan, for, for Tony Dutro. So I want to look up how's Tony Dutro off the claim. I make a notation for that. How a little bit of a layoff. This is a horse that's run some fast figures in the past. He's certainly a contender, at least for a piece. I want to look up Tony off the claim. Claim is from Wayne Potts, um, who was a fairly, you know, a reasonable claiming trainer, but not a tough guy to claim from. So now I've got all my stuff to look up, right, on my paper. The next thing I do is I go to Time Form US. So we're going to go away from, from Formulator for now. Yep. And I go to Time Form US. And you can see this screen. This is this is the pace projector. Yes. And the first thing it tells me is, for some reason, it's not, it should say whether it's a fast pace, an even pace, or it favors speed. I know this one is even. I, and I know well, even. How do you know that? Because I looked it up before. Got it. I don't know why, for some reason, it's not there. I promise people when they look up at home, if they use Time Form US, it'll be there. <laughs> I write it down on the bottom of the front page of my on my PPs. I write down that pace projector because keep in mind, I'm going to be on the air discussing this race. As you know, on the air, you want to be able to see things that you've written as quickly and concisely as possible. I used a blue pen to do my notes. For the stuff for Time From US, I do it in purple. So I'm writing down, I'm recreating that thing down on my paper, and I've written that down, and I've gotten their idea of how the race lays out. When I go back over the race, I'm going to look and see if I disagree. Is it possible that the one who they have clearly as the speed is being ridden by an unaggressive rider? Um, do any of the horses like the three, four, and eight have particularly aggressive riders? Do I think that their connections may want to force the issue? You know, to sort of make some conclusions from that. Typically, when you're looking at these pace projectors, are they kind of on... What's the percentage you would say where you agree or disagree, or is it really all over the board when you take it race by race? They're really great at tracks outside of New York where the riders actually seem to ride their horses more the way they should be ridden. In New York, I'll frequently see two horses in front that might be the two and six in this race. Mm -hmm. As you can see, are towards the back of the pack and the, the one is around fourth and the three is around seventh. So I take it with a grain of salt. You know, okay. it, you have to ask yourself, what should they be doing? But New York is funny. Um, it's hard to predict the paces. And is it jockey relevant? I don't know. I would say that it works fairly well, but I feel like I much more frequently when we're covering Churchill Downs or Oakland, I look up and go, boy, that's really close to the pace projector. I feel like I see that more often okay. than I do in New York. Okay. Nonetheless, okay. it's an exercise. It's Often a great exercise. exercise in frustration. <laughs> well, it makes you, but, you know, this is what, you know, you explained to me earlier off camera, you know, this is why you consistently go back and forth between it, especially when you're handicapping in New York. Mm -hmm. okay. I think you want to try to give yourself an idea. And you're going to have to enhance it a little bit um, and, and think about how the riders are and the circumstances. Usually when the one is the clear speed, 
unless that, listen, anything can happen to start, but we're always going to assume clean breaks. One horses will be forward because if you don't go forward with a one horse to speed, you get buried. Correct. So those horses usually will get aggressive rides. Um, now you see these numbers. These are the, these numbers in brown are the, are the, are the time from us numbers. So last five races, I just write them down for each horse in my, um, in, 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 on my PPs. So they're sort of right by the buyer figures. So they're close, you know, on the other side of the PPs, the buyers are before the running line. These are after the right lines. And I, I do mean, it for each horse. Real, real quick, Andy, just sorry. Those, uh, those brown time form numbers that you originally uh, were talking about, do you know, you know, what are they based off of in your experience with them? Well, they're, they're, they're a speed figure, just like a buyer speed figure. Correct. Speed figure, if people aren't familiar with what exactly they are, is they're, they're a number that normalizes the track based on the track speed that day. Okay. No, you know, I shouldn't say no two tracks are the same. There are plenty of tracks that are the same, but, you know, they'll change. They'll be fast or slow, much more, more fast or more slow from one day to the next. And that's why when somebody says, oh, I don't understand. You think this horse is better. He ran a 111 for six furlongs. And this horse, you, he ran a 110. You think the 111? Well, because the normalized speed figures will say that the track was more than a second slower the day he ran a 111. So speed figures normalize times. Very, very few handicappers. They'll use different speed figures. They may look at the thoroughbreds. They may look at the ragazins. They may look at time form. They may look at buyer. Mm -hmm. They might look at Equibase, which I wouldn't use. They're computerized numbers, but some people do. Um, whatever you look at, you don't look at final times because final, I mean, it's important the times, and this is an issue you and I both deal with, mm -hmm. races being timed correctly. Um, but it's important to get the accurate time. But it's important to get the accurate time so that you can make accurate speed figures because speed figures are what really matter. Um, I'm, you know, I get annoyed when people get all excited about track records. Track records, while frequently set by good horses, are much more a function of a track being overly quick on a certain day. Mm -hmm. um, the time form you guys are looking at now, you'll see a, a, a green figure and, and the brown ones. Green is for turf. Um, light blue is for synthetic, but I only care about the dirt figures because this race is on the dirt. Correct. So I'll go through each horse and I'll copy down there. And that's by land and by sea. They're all turf. I'll write them down for no reason other than just because I'm neurotic um there's you know prioritize so i'll go through it'll take me about yes, a minute okay. and a half two minutes to do this so now i've got those in there now i'm going to go to formula okay so okay. now i'll go to formulator and i'll start looking things up so the first thing we said was we wanted to look up linda rice off the claim mm -hmm. so you click on in formulator a trainer's name you left click on the name and you get this thing here right this is all their starters are there Mm -hmm. You can group by name, you can ungroup it, you can do whatever you want. I'm going to customize it to what I want to look at. It's very easy. So I want to look at how Linda Rice has done off the claim in DERF routes over the last five years. So trainer changes first off the claim, I put it on dirt, and what I say, routes, routes. Routes. So now I'll apply it. So it'll take about a half a second, and I can see that Linda Rice is 29 for 99, 29%. 60 of them hit the board, and the ROI is $1.92, which isn't bad. You know, keep in mind with takeout, ROI is figuring around $1.70 if you're breaking even. You know, a lot of times people will look and they'll see with like a Todd Fletcher or a Chad Brown or a Steve Asmussen, you know, they'll have these 25% win average, but it'll say it's $1.75 ROI and they'll say, well, that's not very good. Well, it isn't bad for a trainer because they're actually beating the takeout. You know, they're not having to bet on their horses. So $1.92, while it's not profitable for every $2 bet, it's a solid number. Linda is strong in this situation. Mm -hmm. But now I want to look up how horses do their claim from Danny Gargan. Fortunately, you can't do this from that horse. I have to find a horse that's trained by Danny Gargan. Fortunately, we have one in this race, Parsi Parsimony. Parsimony. Um, and I'm going to see how a horse is done that were claimed on the dirt from Danny Gargan. And here we go, right? There's claim from. Mm -hmm. and this is in their next start, you know, all these stats are the next start. Got it. And lo yeah. and behold, they're 10 for 94, 11%, and the 63 cent ROI. So now I'm thinking, okay, is it really likely that Linda's going to be able to get as good a performance out of Danny Gargan's horses as Danny gets? Well, I'll look at a couple of things. One is that Linda is 
well above average as a trainer, as a claiming trainer. So you've got that going for you. The other thing about Mexican Wonder Boy is he's coming back in just 20 days. Um, and keep in mind, he's coming back as soon as we came back from the break. So we ran for a week after this, source ran, and then she entered him as soon as she could. Trainers will claim horses and try to run them back on the other guy's train. And I think sometimes people think this is insult. You know, like I'm saying, this trainer knows he's not a good trainer. So he claimed it from, you know, this trainer. He knows that trainer's better. No, he knows that trainer has that horse going well. Correct. So wants to get the horse to run back as quickly as possible to take advantage of whatever's been going on. If he lets the horse sit around the barn for two months, it's kind of his baby now or mm-hmm. her baby as the case may be. So I look at that. I'm not thrilled by that number, but I think I still have to look up. How do I feel about Mexican Wonder Boy? And I think, as I said, I wanted to look up the last race that he ran. In. So you click left click on the far on the date in the far left and formulator. And I can look at the race and think, well, here's the chart of the race. Here's the horses that ran second, third, and fourth. The second one came from ninth. The third one came from sixth. And the fourth one came from 10th. So other than Mexican Wonder Boy, who was on top of the pace, everybody else that finished out in the Superfecta came from the clouds. Mm -hmm. The horse that was the speed, Musical America, was 10 to 1. He finished about three lengths, four lengths behind Mexican Wonder Boy. Okay, back in eighth. The other horse who was on top of the pace, he finished ahead of him at 15 to one. So effectively, Mexican Wonder Boy significantly outran the other speeds. And most of the effective running in this race was done by horses that were closing. So I think it's fair to say that Mexican Wonder Boy ran a little bit better than it looks on paper. Because he was involved in what was a contested quick pace. Mm -hmm. And he survived it. Now, you do have to factor in the fact that it was a sloppy track. Maybe he really liked the sloppy track. It's possible. I don't worry about those things that much. I find that people, most horses will run similarly on on sloppy, drier, wet wet surfaces. It's more a function of whether their trip works out. And the thing that really interests me in this case is looking at the pace projector. And as we look through the field, Messon Wonderboy is the clear speed on paper in this race. So unlike the last race where he got engaged, Daddy Knows, who was involved in pace, Musical America, those are horses that have extreme speed. Mm -hmm. There's nobody in this race on paper that has the kind of speed they have. Mm -hmm. So now you're going to say Mexican Wonder Boy is going to likely face a much more favorable circumstance. So he did well under unfavorable circumstances last time. Now he's going to face more favorable circumstances in theory. So I think it's reasonable to expect that he could run even better than he did last time. Then you move on. Okay. I didn't really have much I wanted to look up on Boldish. I didn't need to look anything up on Lost in Rome. I wanted to look up the pedigree on By Land and Sea. So left click on the dam. This is the beauty of Formulator. And you get the da- it's the, you get her, her up. Now she's never run, she's unraced. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll look up her second dam. No information on her, she's old, she might've run. Now I'm gonna look up who the source is related to. And the first one that comes up is Sweet By and By. Sweet By and By is a very nice turf horse. And that's probably why Steve Laceris and Tony Dutro, both who claimed Sweet By, trained Sweet By and By at some point, why they ran this horse in the turf, because she was a really good turf horse. Except interestingly enough, when you go through her PPs, yeah, she ran a 92, 91, but she also ran an 87 buyer in her, she ran a 62 buyer on turf in her debut. Mm-hmm. Two year old turf figures. Horses are very rarely fast as two-year-olds in turf races. They have slow pace at those races. It's rare they come up as high numbers. Correct. But she ran an 87 on the dirt in her third career start. And then she went to the turf and ran a 78 and 82. Then she went back to the dirt and ran an 88 winning at Saratoga. Then she ran and she ran on turf again. And she got really good on turf. But she had actually run on dirt and run well. So I have to imagine that's why Tony Dutro left her. He said, you know what? Sweet By and By was ultimately a turf horse, but she could run well on the dirt. So let's see if that's the case. Now, By Land NC is a Cairo Prince. And even though Cairo Prince was at one time on the Triple Crown Trail, I think he won or lost the Remsen by a nose to honor code. I know they hit the wire together. I don't I remember think, which one I think won. He lost, yeah. You think he lost? Yeah, I, I could, Kieran trained him, right? Oh, yeah, honor, you would remember honor, though. You might have been, were you working for Todd Fletcher when? No, he didn't have honor. 
No, nope. Shug. That was Shug. Yeah, right. Shug, uh, it was Shug. That wasn't, no, that wasn't. Shug. Right, I'm thinking of Havana who beat him in the in the champagne. Got it, okay, right. yeah. Um, so I think Cairo Prince has been a much more effective turf sire, to be honest. It's a pioneer of the Nile. But you know what? This horse has enough pedigree that says, and let me look at the other horses. So I'll look at the other balls. Okay, the only, this is him. This one, they did not run well in the dirt, but ran okay in the turf. Here's another one that primarily only ran on turf. Here's another one that was about as good as one dirt race. It is mostly a turf family. Yes. But I think there's enough to say with Sweet By and By that I wouldn't think it's impossible that this horse could handle the dirt, though not the kind I like. And then I come to prioritize, right? So I know this horse was on the rail. So I go, we'll go to this page. I go to um, the track trends page. There we go. Okay. And describe, track yeah, describe track trends. Track form. trends. Go ahead. Track oh, no, trends, just, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I, I write it up every every day. I write this for the for the website. I don't put it on the website. Somebody smarter than me puts it in the website. I write down when the track was fast. If it rained during the day, I include you know different track conditions, cloudy or clear for whatever reason, the temperature, and I look up the wind as well. And I put the wind numbers down. And then I write a synopsis of how I thought the track played. Um, obviously, it's more complicated when there's turf racing. It's easier when there's dirt because on one surface. A lot of times, you know, I'll show you. It says, I just think the track's played fairly. There we go. December 18th, track played fairly. December 17th, track played fairly. Mm -hmm. December 16th, while inside speed well in some races overall, the track appeared to play fairly. I'm not, a lot, I think a lot of people are constantly searching for biases. Okay. You know, they're like that. seeing biases in their dreams. I don't. Okay. In New York, I feel like our tracks are fair much more often than not. So I'm careful about biases. And, you know, sometimes I'll say it's worth thinking about whether or not the rail was bad this day, March follow it going forward. You know, I try to plant seeds, um, but I use these things. So we'll go back to November 28th, the day the source ran. And it says there were four dirt races. Three were won by inside speed and two of them odds on favorites and one at 22 to one while the other seemed to play fairly. It's tough to say it was in my bias, but it's worth noting. Okay, right. so over time and watching some of those horses come back, I think there is some evidence that it was an inside speed type track. So the winner of this race, Empty Tomb, wired the field on the inside, but he also came back to run fairly well in a stake race in his next start, to be fair. But while Prioritize was trying to close from way back, he was on the rail. So he wasn't the best part of the racetrack. He right. just may have been against the way the flow of the racetrack that day. Um, he is a horse prioritized. And the reason I think he's important here is that he's got back form that can beat everybody in this field. He's the one horse in here that last year, I mean, this horse finished third, beating three lengths in the Woodward at Saratoga, Grand Global Campaign and, 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 and Tacitus. So he is not that, that far removed from being the fastest horse in the race. The problem and that was is, my, sorry, Andy, that was my next question. As far as, as far as back form is considered, how big of a deal is it as far as back form? Is it just depending on how far that back form goes or where do you, as far as back form, how much does it matter to you? It, it matters because you know that somewhere inside of a horse is a race that can be effective here, but you don't want to be, overly dismissive of current form right correct you know one of the things i hate that people say is throw out the last race no don't ever throw out a last race you may come to the conclusion as to why you want to throw out a last race but don't throw out a race because it suits your it's convenient to do that that's just lazy um you 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 want to tell me a reason um i'm going to say well I'll give the horse a little bit of credit because it wasn't a supersonic pace. The pace held together and the horse was trying to come from last. So I'll say at least he did a little running. I mean, he did get a 91 buyer. It is the second highest last race buyer in this field. So he didn't run that badly. He was a little disappointing, but he was also seven to one. Um, he ran okay, well enough to say he has some form. The problem is he's once again in a race where there isn't an abundance of speed. And the horse he has to beat, who's outside of him, untreated, he has a similar running style and he's a closer, but he has more tactical speed. So the horses he has to beat so far in my head are a horse that figures to control the pace, 
and a horse that may just be better than all of them, that's going to be sort of middle of the road. And mm -hmm. so prioritize is going to have to outclose untreated or hope untreated doesn't show up. You can always hope that horses don't show up, but that's not how you handicap, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Unless you have some reason why you don't think untreated will run well. We'll get to that. Um, and hope that, you know, the Mexican horse doesn't run well off the claim from Danny Gargan. And that's not an unreasonable assumption. Mm -hmm. Linda Rice or not, it's still tough to claim from Danny Gargan. I think you have to keep that in mind. <clears throat> Excuse me. So going to untreated next. The one thing I want to look up about Untreated is Untreated is won his last race coming off a seven plus month lay. Mm -hmm. um, I want to look up how Todd Fletcher does coming off of wins in dirt races off of those kind of layups. Yep. And the way I've decided to look at it, I don't want outliers. I bunch it two months around the layup. So it was a, it was a seven and a half month, but we'll say it was a seven month layup. Sure. So I go, 30 days in a month, effectively, 150 days, five months, um, 270 days, nine months. So I say, how does Todd Fletcher do second off a layoff of 150 to 270 days off a win on the dirt? And then I want to look, how does he do off a win in dirt routes? Because this horse is a router. So we're going to look that up for Todd Fletcher. So hopefully I can handle all this stuff on the screen we got here. Um, okay, so we've got one its last on the dirt, and here's the layoff thing. Second off, this is going to be difficult because I'm you've got that screen over my uh, what did I say, 150. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Can I minimize this a little bit? You can I do can, it, you can oh, do whatever you want. Thank you, I appreciate that. <laughs> I don't know if this is working very well. No, it's not. Oh, wait, here we go. There no, we go. I can't, I can't get it to, to move to the left. Oh, wait, there we go. All right. <laughs> but I say we'll make, we'll make a Zoom expert out of you yet. So here's Todd Fletcher's numbers off of um five to nine month layoffs off a of win, second off a of five to nine month layoff off a of win in a dirt. Yes. He's 15 for 39, 38% with an ROI of just over $2. That's terrific. It's he great. does well with those things. Mm -hmm. Let's see how he does in dirt routes because he's a router. Maybe he's not as good in routes. Maybe he's better in routes. So now we'll narrow it down to routers and I'll apply that. So he's 14 for 28, which basically means that he's one for 11 with sprinters. With routers, he's 50% with an ROI of $2.74. Yeah, they're horses that are basically nine to five shots, but they're winning half of the time. That's remarkable. Now I can further look it up and see if he has his good numbers at Naira. Because don't forget, Todd wins a lot of races down at Gulfstream and a lot of them are horses coming off layoffs, et cetera. So look at today's circuit and we'll look at that. Now he's not as good. He's just three for 11 with $1.70 ROI. So he's actually 11 for 17 outside of New York. So that mitigates it a little bit to me. It says Todd is amazingly great second off layoffs like this, off of wins and dirt routes, but he has not had the success in the Naira tracks that he has had at other tracks. So that makes me take another step back a little bit and it opens the door a little bit that maybe this horse won't run back as well to that race. And if you look at the odds, one of them was six to one, one of them made 18 to one. You had nine to five, eight to five, three to five, four to one, 15 cents the dollar, one to nine, seven to two. They were short prices, most of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he didn't do that great in New York for what it's worth. It may be a bit of an aberration and very well out of town. So now I go through some more and I look some different things up on the rest of the field. The one thing I wanted to look up that we hadn't looked up yet was how Tony Dutro is off the claim on the dirt because he has the worst on the bottom, Croatian. He was the one thing I had. Oh no, I wanted to look up. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. I wanted to look up 235 running against who he ran against at Mahoning Valley last time. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the horses came back to win. That horse did come back in fairness and run 14 buyer points higher and is generally much better than the race he ran. So, you know what? Maybe this horse didn't run that badly, but he also benefited from the fact the race sort of set up well for him. The second horse, the second horse in here, um, he sort of ran it. He's not that good. And I get a feel and I can go through the horses and think, you know what? It wasn't an extra special field. Nobody that special, blah, blah, blah. 
Um, I can look up the same thing for parsimony, parsimony. Um, he was involved in the pace at Parks. Okay, the speed in the race finished last, to be fair, at almost 10 to one. That horse generally runs much better, but isn't that good a horse. But the other horse who's part of the pace actually finished ahead of him and finished third. And that horse in finishing third, um, in fairness to him, he didn't really run his race either. He's a little better. So I think in looking at this chart, I'm saying to myself, Parsimony didn't run as badly as the 66 buyer suggests, but he didn't run well enough to have run a figure. He's probably going to need to run a figure of at least 90 to be competitive in this race, judging right. by Mexican Wonder Boy, untreated, and even prioritized. So I can give him a little bit of an excuse, but not a strong enough one. Um, finally, Croatian, I want to look up a Tony Dutchrow off the claim, right? So let's look up Tony off the claim over the last five years. It's probably a low number. He's one for 13 with four hitting the board. Mm -hmm. Let's further look up the number and see how he is in the dirt. He's 0 for 10 with two hitting the board. So in a relatively small sample size, Tony has had no success off the claim. So what that says to me is two things. One is, if you really like this horse at a price, I wouldn't dismiss him because of that. But it's not particularly reasonable to expect that you're going to see Tony dramatically improve this horse off the claim. Right. So if he's good enough for me to use the race on handicapping, that's fine. But there's nothing about the trainer change that suggests I'm going to see some sort of miracle out there. <laughs> so now I would go back and I would watch any replays I had, I wanted to watch. So... Just for the sake of this, let's watch the replay of Mexican Wonder Boy. So I go to Naira Betts, I look at the date, and Mexican Wonder Boy is the nine in this race. And we'll take a look at this race and we'll see how he was ridden and how the other speeds did. And the first thing to note is that there wasn't any significant trouble at the start in this race. Nothing majorly happened. The race set up. But listen, you've got a bunch of horses that are forward here, right? You've got one that went with Mexican Wonder Boy, but the one horse rushed up down the inside and he heated the pace up. In general, you're not, I wouldn't say rarely, but it's not frequent that two horses create a speed duel. But if the third horse gets involved in the pace up front, that'll heat things up. Right. And this situation, you had three horses that were essentially vying for the lead. Um, vintage Hollywood was sitting fourth behind them. But it is worth noting that while Mexican Wonder Boy is two to one. All the other horses that are anywhere close to the pace are long shots. They're 10 to one, they're 14 to one, mm -hmm. they're 26 to one and 20 to one. So it's also fair to say, did we really expect those horses to stick around at the end? And the answer is no, we don't. No. But I think it's fair also to look at them and say, did they underachieve? And I think that arguably they didn't, they underachieved a little bit, at least as far as they finished. Mm -hmm. So now Mexican Wonder Boy has sort of seized control of this race. And you've got this whole array of horses coming behind. And all the chasers at this point are going to completely fall apart. And the field's going to come in, but close in. But they never make a serious run at Me Mexican Wonder Boy. And I don't think we learned a great deal. There were no major trips to see. The horse down the rail, who's going to finish fourth, he's actually in the fifth race. He might have had a little trouble negotiating inside. But what happened was the race fell apart in the late stages and Mexican Wonder Boy was able to hold on. So I'm going to move him up a little bit. And one of the things I like about Mexican Wonder Boy in this race, aside from that, is that Linda Rice claimed this horse for 32000 off that effort. And she's entering the horse back in an optional claiming race where the tag is 62.5. She's showing confidence. Linda Rice has outstanding numbers as a trainer off of wins, particularly on the dirt. When Linda Rice gets a horse in good form, they often will not only hold that form, but Im improve on it. And mm -hmm. I like to look at trainer stats off of wins. In her case, I wouldn't look as much because she's claiming off a win for somebody else. Mm -hmm. Because it's tough to win back-to-back -to -back races. Right. Because circumstances, a lot of horses win races because they had favorable circumstance that day. A lot of horses that come off wins are moving up in class. So it's not easy to do. So when I find a trainer like Linda Rice, who has the best numbers of any trainer I've ever seen off of wins in the dirt, and she claims a horse and she moves it up aggressively, I have to think that's a good sign. She feels positively about this horse. She's not jamming the horse back in and she wants this horse. 
and she's moving up in class. So I think if she's confident, I can have a sense of confidence she's going to run his best race. And so I make him a major contender because at this point, I've got nothing left to look up. All I'm going to do at this point is go through the field. And by the way, when I make notes in Formulator, I use a green pen. Yes. When I make, when I let's, make, let's get into that right now. You okay. have a color-coded system. Just uh, quickly route off for me uh, your bias of what you use. I know you start out with navy, but uh, and then purple for dirt on time form. But let's let's go on from there. What are you? What's your color? What's Andy Serling's color-coded system? I have green for formulators for anything from formulator, whether it's trainer stats, whether it's information on where they ran, who they ran against, different things like that. Um, I also write the turf time form numbers down in green. I write in light blue for um, pedigree stuff to set that apart. Okay. And there isn't that much that obviously a lot in two-year-old races or first-time turf races. Right. And I write down notes for trips from replays in red. Trips that sticks red. out. And okay. then I put everything together with purple because um, I like purple. I thought the four major horses I would be interested in here are the one Mexican Wonder Boy, the five prioritized, the six untreated, and the 10 Croatian. Because Croatian is a horse getting back into it that has some back figures that are fast enough to give him a chance. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's fair to say that Tony Dutro has been, of course, been running well for him. And while he hasn't had a lot of success claiming over the last five years, Tony's a very good trainer that got very quiet for about mm -hmm. five years or more. Mm -hmm. This year, he started winning again. So I'm not sure that looking at formulator stats and Tony in the last five years is that relevant anymore. Because the Tony Dutro that I know from 10 years ago, even more, was a highly successful, very, very good trainer. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, mostly probably due to not having any good horses, he sort of disappeared for a while, but he seems to be back and he's been doing very well this year. So I'm gonna leave that horse in. Um, I have to decide how do I feel about untreated. And I think there's a couple of things. One thing I have to make picks for the race. Um, that's important, I gotta make the picks. But I also think you have to look at the race and ask yourself, how am I, am I betting this race? Um, and if I'm betting it, in what manner am I betting it? There's so much talk about multi-race bets these days. Yeah, what's and your... I understand why. Mm -hmm. Because they're low takeout bets. And these discussions center around takeout. And I get that. And that's fair. But the thing is that what makes exotic bets appealing is that you're using your handicapping acumen to diffuse takeouts through more than one slot. There's no difference theoretically between an exact and a daily double in that standpoint. It's a one takeout bet involving two slots, be it win, win or win place. Mm -hmm. So every one of us, anyone that, wants to be or tries to be or becomes a successful horse player has to beat the takeout. And you don't beat the takeout by picking winners. You beat the takeout by picking better winners than everybody else that's betting. So when you bet win, you've got one takeout. If you bet an exact or a double, you've got two, but you have two slots to fuse it. So if I feel I'm that much better than the next guy, I'm not going to be that much better than the next guy twice. A trifecta and a pick three three slots, a super factor to pick four, four slots. I don't play super high fives, but in theory, super high, whatever they call them, super high five, whatever it is, or the pick five, mm -hmm. five slots. You're spreading your handicapping acumen. So the reality is you diffuse that higher takeout. So somebody says win takeout is 17%. Trifecta takeout is 25%. Yes, I'm, 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 this one, I'm not a moron. I'm very clear that it's better to have 83 cents return from a dollar than 75 cents return a dollar. Mm -hmm. But I'm also just as clear that neither one of them are particularly good. <laughs> so since I've already made that decision that I'm gonna bet into this takeout, I wanna try to diffuse it through as many slots as I can. And I think you have to ask yourself, what is it about this race that I find the most interesting that would make me wanna bet? Am I just trying to survive this race from the standpoint of a pick five? in which case I'm gonna lean heavily on Untreated and Mexican Wonder Boy, and I'll back up with Prioritize in Croatia. Or let's say 
I think that untreated in Mexico under Roy have to be part of the, the try, but I'm not sure there's a significant difference in the likelihood of them winning. So I'm going to lean heavily on Mexican Wonder Boy on top and try to make money if he upsets Untreated. I feel Untreated is very likely to be no worse than third, probably second. And then I want to play tries and I want to keep Mexican Wonder Boy mostly in first, a little second, using Untreated with Prioritize and Croatia. And I'm not sure this race is a great example for that play, but I think the point I'm trying to make in this is there's so much talk about multi-race bets that I think that people have lost sight of the options that they have available to them a little bit. You know, when I was playing full time and I was going to Florida in the winter, they had, I think, two pick threes a day like we had in New York at the time. Mm -hmm. We didn't have rolling pick threes down there. So we focused on exactas and tries for the most part. And it was something that worked very well. I feel as though as a player, I, like a lot of people, have gotten away from that because we become this, this, this multi-race centric. And I think it's happened at the expense of looking at exactas and tries. But I, at the very least, think as a handicapper, better. Because, yeah, there's two roles to my job, your job. Talking about race on TV, handicapping, come up with ideas. But mm -hmm. as a better, and I like to bet. Um, I don't bet as much as I used to. It's harder when you're on the air. Um, I don't want to, you know, have too many mood swings related to my betting. I, while I'm yes, on the air. I agree. Yep. Um, but I think you need to look at these races and ask yourself, because, you know, you find a weak favorite. I hear very bad advice being given out um, by people that don't really understand betting multi-race bets about how you're supposed to throw out favorites and such. Mm -hmm. But I think if you find a weak favorite, you can bet tries. And by the way, it's not bad to have that weak favorite finish second. Yeah. You have to, in my opinion, to make be successful as a better, you want to limit to yourself the amount of times you need to be right to collect. And if you like a 12 to one shot to race, you want to bet, let's say you're betting $100 in the race. Say you bet 40 to win on it. Your next bet should be a 30, let's should be about an exacta, maybe bet 30 to win. Bet a $30 exacta. Yeah. With that horse second to the favorite. This is something that I learned a long time ago from the smartest, most successful better I've ever known. Not a great handicapper, but an incredibly <laughs> successful better. Because handicapping and betting are two different things. And his point to me was, you have a great opinion on long shots, but you get overly carried away being against favorites. Your opinion is you like this long shot. That's your opinion. Don't have your opinion be, I like this long shot and I hate the favorite. Now you're putting yourself in a position and you know what? You might think that favorite is somewhat vulnerable. You still want to have that exacta and then you could play some other exactas with bigger priced horses and really score out when the favorite doesn't win. But don't let that 480 horse win with your 15 to one shot finish second, have the exacta pay $53 and, and, and not make real money on the race. Make sure you cash when you're right and don't Thanks. have to be that right. don't have to be that right. And that, I think that's the biggest takeaway from it. And I think that kind of alludes to a bit of your philosophy as well. So then let's, uh, let's dig into a little, let's get into a little bit more um, just handicapping and handicapping slash betting uh, talk. You know, what is one piece of advice that you have for the newbie handicappers out there? Well, um, I mean, I think, let me just start more broadly. Yes, there's this there has always been this big outside conversation of getting younger people involved in the game. <laughs> Racing's not for everybody, you know. Um, I think. Maybe racing is like I think I think Jerry Garcia said the Grateful Dead were like licorice. Not everybody likes licorice, but those right. that like it like it a lot. Right. And since I like Jerry Garcia and the Grateful Dead, I think it's also a very good horse racing analogy, to be honest. It's, it's great. Yes. Horse racing is not for everybody. It isn't. There are plenty of people that are gonna have no interest in it at all. That's fine. There's plenty of great stuff out there that you and I have no interest. We also don't have a problem with somebody else having an interest in it. It's just not for us. Right. But I think for people that 
like racing and get exposed to it in a positive way, it can be the most interesting thing in the world. And who's to say that we're not spending our lives in the most noblest of pursuits, spending our lives in the racetrack? <laughs> Who knows what a, what a truly noble pursuit is in that situation? And um, I find handicapping incredibly interesting and exciting. I think, yes, I do think it's tough to teach people reading the PPEs and doing it. But I do think that, you know, yeah, Saratoga is a place where people go to the track. It's really fun. It's really exciting. And they find they get turned on by it. Yeah. I did as a kid. And then you want to learn more. So right. I think we have to sort of hope that we're exposing people to racing and those, what we need to do is maybe the number is two out of a thousand people would be interested in racing. I'm okay with that. We just want to find a way to get those two people exposed. Right. I don't know that racing always gets to those two people. There are people out there that are going to love horse racing. So if somebody gets involved and they find they love it, um, learn to read the BPs. Um, don't accept things at face value that people tell you. Don't believe all those you know, those, those old racetrack axioms. Don't just take, learn for your, learn things for yourself. Ask questions, you know, yes. don't accept things. Um, figure out what you believe, you know? Yeah, I think, you know, Andy Byers books are great, um, but watch a lot of races and, and try to figure things out for yourself. And don't, you know, like, you know, people will say they listen to me on TV and I, you know, I have very strong opinions. Andy talked me off a horse. Well, I shouldn't be talking you onto or off of any horse. Offer some information. If you think it makes sense to you, if something I say makes sense, that's fine. If something I say doesn't make sense to you, then why would you listen to it? <laughs> Just because I think it's true doesn't make it true. Um, right. it, it has to be true for you. So I think racing is something to keep an open mind. And there's so many different ways to look at races, to, to take things apart. There's a lot of different roads to get to a winner. I mean, sometimes I ask myself, I'll, I'll feel like I'm really smart after a race and I think a winner and I think to myself, maybe I just got lucky there. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe I just, you know, maybe I, 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 I walked through the wrong door and I ended up at the right party. I don't know, you know? I love that. I love that analogy. Yeah. Um, so then now let's dig into a crowd that we know and love, our experienced horse players, our experienced handicappers, uh, ones that putting it, putting it kind of in your own words, they seem to have developed these own mind biases for themselves. What's your piece of advice to them? Um, well, I'm, I'm extremely cynical. So I just am basically mistrustful of people who say absolutes. Um, don't listen to tips. <laughs> no, <laughs> no tips. Tips are, are a waste of time. Um, they're not going to help you over time. They will occasionally, but they won't. Um, I, I don't know. You know, I think that people have to learn to do things they're comfortable with. Just, just accept the gospel of others. If somebody tells you something and you've really thought about it and it makes sense to you, that's fine. And, but also have an open mind to things. There isn't one right approach to things. I might do something one way and somebody else may do it a different way. Maybe we're both wrong. Maybe we're both right. I don't know, but I don't think it's an absolute that one is right and the other's not right. I think people have to find their own path in handicapping. To me though, I think people should enjoy it. As long as you're enjoying it at some level, are you enjoying the handicap? You know, is it just something you're insatiably doing it because of the gambling aspect? And don't, I like the gambling aspect, I do. I don't have an enormous amount of gamble in me. I like more the handicapping intellectual approach and how does that apply to gambling, to, to betting? The one thing I would say to people is, I, I don't like the, the term mentor. I was very lucky when I was a kid. I started going to the racetrack in 1975, effectively. And I met people like Paul Mellos, Joe Cardello, Andy Beyer. Um, but Joe, Joe particularly, because Paul wasn't around that much, who I knew. These were experienced, smart people who played the game, different people. I, got, I had an opportunity as a kid because I was inquisitive and went up during Saratoga and met all of these professional horse players as a kid, really serious guys who really aren't the tracks anymore. And I gleaned, I can look back on all of these people and tell you the things, one thing I learned from each of them um, that helped me throughout my life in handicapping. So if you can be around people that have been successful as horse players, 
listen to them and, and try to find the things that they think or things they say to you that make a certain amount of sense. But like I said, never accept things at face value. Think about them yourself and make sure they work for you. But I think that racing is the most interesting thinking man's or thinking woman's game there is. And it's not going to be for everybody. But for those people that find it fascinating, I think you'll find it endlessly fascinating. I, I've been going the racetrack for um, 47 years. And I am as excited by a day's card now as I ever was. I mean, everybody has their ups and downs, but I, I've never stopped loving racing. Arguably, I might love it more now than I ever loved it before. Um, so it's made, it's made my life great. and Maybe it can make your life better. Andy, well, do you remember the first time that you've ever went to a racetrack before? Or the, the first time I went to track. Yeah. My, yeah. Do you, do you have that memory? Yeah. My father dragged me to Liberty Bell when they used to have thoroughbreds there mm -hmm. before they tore it down. My last trip to Liberty Bell was in the pouring rain in college when after losing all my money, my roommate on the way back to his car in a pouring rainstorm gave me the news that he had locked his keys in the car, but that's another story. Um, I, I had no real interest in racing. And, you know, when we moved to Saratoga, we moved to Saratoga when I was 11, I went to the harness track, which back then used to run from around April through October. We moved at Labor Day, right after the meet, the meet where Secretary lost Onion. And uh, so I went to the harness track with my dad a few times. It just didn't really interest me. And then when Saratoga opened, I can still remember, I can remember walking on the grounds with my father, the opening day, my dad, loved to bet trifectas and they were only in the last race back then the ninth race okay and so he would leave and we'd go over the last two races my dad would handicap the triple in the last race and i can remember walking into the grounds at saratoga and it was a little different back then but not that different and looking around and you know thinking oh this is really cool wow this is like four blocks from where my family lives this is going on it feels like there's something really exciting going on around here and by that was a four week meet back then. So that was the first week. By the end of the third week, I was going every day for the entire day. I didn't know anything at that point. I saw Ruffian. I knew about Ruffian. I saw her win the spin away. I stood by the finish line to see her. So I'd read about her in the New York Times. Oh, that's um, so. And exciting. after that, and I still have them, I still have them right here. I have my Aqueduct chart book. Oh, and these God. are charts I started cutting out of the New York Times. They used to have the condensed racing form charts. And I still have them um, from 1974 and 1975. All the charts of horses for most of the races in New York. Unfortunately, Saturday is the big day. They would often print the Sunday Times earlier, so it wouldn't have all the full charts. There's a lot of you know famous races I have left out, but I got some great stuff in there. And I was hooked. That was it. And then Picking Winners came out in April. Um, you know, eight months later, and it was reviewed in the Times. And my dad read a review, and he bought me Picking Winners, and that was it. My life was just beginning or over or whatever it was but <laughs> just, I, I never stopped I could probably sit you here with you for hours and just hear the stories of just you you know getting into you know getting in and learning from all of these you know high-end betters and handicappers and it's we I wish we had another two hours um but that would that was an amazing story. Uh, thank you for that. That was oh, that was, that was such a treat for me to hear. Um, and Sarah, and you know, it's Saratoga. There's just something about the air up there at Saratoga, right? Right. I think that's why it's important for all of us to get friends to come to Saratoga. Yeah. Because right. somewhere among all those friends we bring will be somebody that the light goes off for them. Yes. And you'll make their life better, and it's better for racing. Uh, you know, I, I think that we we're assuming that it's bad that most people don't like racing most people don't like everything right. you know you can whatever you want to name most people don't like it but there are people that love it and that's the thing about racing it's the it's that thing they don't just like it they love it it's it's something that people will get obsessed about and that's a great thing Place so it's easy to, it's easy to say out of belmont aqueduct saratoga that saratoga would be your favorite it is, um, you know, my mom's still there, so I could see her a lot. And my, you know, I, I'm at Saratoga. And I mean, you, you've spent a lot of time there, so you know what it's like. I mean, you I always, do. you unfortunately had a different work schedule, but the idea of walking downtown at night, walking to restaurants, meeting friends, friends coming up, it's so much different. I take the subway out to Aqueduct. I love Aqueduct. You know, Aqueduct is the first track outside of Saratoga I went to with my grandmother. We used to take the Aqueduct special out. I think Belmont's a great track. I, I love lots of, Laurel, where you are. I think Laurel's a great track. I love going to Laurel. It is like um, it is, you yeah. know. Um, I miss the old Gulf Stream. I spent amazing winters there back in the 90s. Um, I miss that. Um, 
you know, Santa Anita, there are a lot of really great tracks to go to. I, I, but, you know, I'm at the New York tracks and I like each and every one of them, but Saratoga is, is a special place. Special it's going to be a place for a lot of people, you know, even if you're not into racing, you know, I have ex-girlfriends that used to go there with me that still go up now with their friends. It's so <laughs> oh my gosh. Not to see me. I love, I love it though. Well, they end up seeing you anyway, because you're on screen, you know, you're on screen for most of it. So I'm sure it's not, it's, it's not all bad. Um, it's, it's, it's partly bad for them. It's fine for <laughs> me. <laughs> okay. So then let's just circle back uh, really quick. What's the, sure. we taught, we previously touched on this before, but what's the biggest overall mistake you see what these betters and these handicappers make when handicapping. Now I know betters and handicappers two you know, apples and oranges essentially in your eyes, but uh, just overall, just one of the biggest mistakes. Um, I think the biggest mistake somebody makes in handicapping is going into a race with preconceived notions. Ah, oh, they can't beat this horse, you know? Oh, I'm treated, you know, he was so good last time. He's a stakes horse. They can't beat him. Never go into a race with preconceived. And by the way, also don't go in and say, I can't wait to bet against untreated. Because maybe you look at the race and you say, you know what? Like, as I look at the race and I may take a small shot against him, but I'm not against him. He's way the worst to be. He ran well. Right. I don't totally trust him. You know, he's got some gaps. He's obviously got some issues like they all do. But, but in general, I, I think don't go into a race. Try to have a clean slate. That's like, I'll, I'll use a, a giant example of this. Who's your derby horse? Why would we want to possibly have a derby horse before really at least till after all the preps are done run? You might want to wait for the draw to see what post you get. The right. post really isn't that relevant because right. there's a quarter mile to the first turn. Right. But why why do I want to decide in January? I like a horse. I mean, it's, it's fine if you want to make a few small bets. If if you want in those derby pools, I don't agree with it. But you know, you like some horse and he's 70 to one and you want to bet a few dollars on him, fine. But be open, you know, like anything. Say, geez, I really like Dex horse, but when I watch his preps, he's not that good. Or maybe he starts getting overrated, you know? Right. I mean, keep an open mind to races. Don't form opinions well in advance. Be able to look at a race as objectively as possible. And it's hard. We all have biases, like I said, but try to be as unbiased as you can. Right. If you were to follow it, so let's talk about your bias. What kind of bias do you try and you avoid it but sometimes you can't help it what bias does your mind kind of fall into sometimes um that's that's a good question um i'd say trainers you know trainers that don't win sometimes you have to ask yourself especially when you get into the winter well every trainer wins races sometimes yeah. these are the kind of races this trainer is going to win you know yeah they're not going to win stakes at saratoga or two-year-old maiden race or but you know what? They might be okay in a you know non of two lifetime twenty five twenty thousand dollar claiming race in, in January in Aqueduct. So you know, I, I try to get away from the bias of I don't want to bet that trainer because also remember something: you could bet any horse at the right price. Maybe that right price is three hundred to one, but at the right price you can bet any horse. So I try to be as objective. You know, you you, you know, I think trainers matter, but. The, the landscape of horse racing is littered with great horses trained by bad trainers. I'm not going to name any to criticize anybody, but there have been some truly great horses <laughs> trained by trainers that weren't particularly good. And by the same token, and you know this for working for Todd Fletcher, like you did, you've had a lot of bad horses go through that barn. I don't care how good Todd is. He exactly. can't make those horses run fast. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, you know, a, a bad horse in any trainer's barn is a problem and a good horse is great to have in any trainer's barn. So don't get overly caught up in that. Um, but I don't, I'm biases, you know, don't, I want to make sure like, oh, I bet this horse the last two times, you know, he had a bit of a trip two back. So I tried him again last time. He kind of stunk. I don't want him to burn me today. Fine. And bet $20 on him and forget about it, but don't, pick, you know, don't fall back on horses you've been in the past. Don't try to justify bad picks in the past. And by the same token, win with a horse, have a good opinion on him and then move on. Don't pick it the next time to go, Oh, I had him last time. So what? <laughs> it doesn't mean anything today. So it's all, I think it's all about having preconceived biases. Once again, being as open minded as you can, Listen, I struggle with it. I'm not saying it's easy. And I think it's hard for everyone. So let's get away from the philosophical a little bit. Um, what's your favorite type of race to handicap? Um, you know, I, I don't really have one. 
okay. because different kinds of races, I love races with horses trying the turf for the first time. Okay. Like I like, I like a turf maiden race, not necessarily full of first time starters, mm -hmm. but you know, with horses that have dirt for them because, you know, one of the, one of the places you can get, um, real, I don't, value is a tough word. You can get paid is first time turfers because there are horses that can't stand up in the dirt to get on the turf. They're stakes horses yeah, and vice versa. So you'll sometimes get a horse that has a gigantic turf move up pedigree that ran twice in the dirt and ran terribly. And you get that horse in the turf, it's a completely different horse. And that's the kind of horse you might get $48 on um, first time in the grass. So I like those races. I think those can be really interesting. I like, and we run, fortunately we run a lot of those races in New York. You run a fair amount in Maryland as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think those can be really interesting. Um, I like, I like turf racing a lot, bigger fields. Um, trips play a more important role because one of the reasons that trainers like turf racing is the, 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 the seventh best horse in turf race might lose by three and a half lengths. So mm -hmm. he can lie to his owner after the race and tell him why he should have, he could have won that race. <laughs> Whereas the same horse in the dirt were lost by 12 lengths. And it's tough to lie to him. You don't have an answer lengths. for that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so trainers like it for that reason. But also right. what it does is it, it's, I call it the smush factor. It brings the fields together. So I can have a horse that might be the fourth best horse in the race, but he might be able to get circumstances that, make him closer to being able to win the race you know right. so it brings them together so i also i don't like it when it rains i wish it didn't rain when come on the turf all the turf races could be the greatest value in racing sometimes uh we saw some of that opening day at santa anita mm -hmm. um you know keep an open mind to those don't just when, when it rains in saratoga it's it sucks i know you go to saratoga big day of racing it rains mm -hmm. make the most of it because they're the most misbet races in horse racing are off the turf races People will insist on betting horses they liked in the turf. Look at that going global in the grade one race at, 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 on Sunday at, at Santa Anita. She was four to five in the dirt in a mile and a quarter with a European turf pedigree. Who in their right mind would bet? <laughs> that, you know, now I'm not, I couldn't pick the winner. I had the, the other horse for Mike McCarthy uh, that ran badly. He won with another long shot, but I didn't care about that. You had to bet against her. She finished nowhere at four to five. If mm -hmm. you can throw out effectively four to five shots from 10 horse fields, you'll be fine in the long run. So there's value in those races. I think, you know, those off the turf races can, not always, sometimes you have a four horse field and mm -hmm. it's obvious, but sometimes there's real value to be had in those races. So then let's get into, you know, tracks outside of uh, New York. What other, uh, what overall, just some, your common favorite tracks that you like to play? I really, honestly, pretty much only play New York. I looked at a little bit of Churchill this year because we cover their races. Um, we'll cover Oakland in the winter, so I'll look a little more at their races. I'm not going to do the level of work there, though, that I do in New York. There just aren't enough hours in the day. I do do right. a, a decent amount of work. Um, but so I think New York is tough, to be honest. There's opportunities elsewhere. I, 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 I don't know. You know, I, I haven't I don't play enough tracks anymore to have a real feeling. You know, there was a time that Florida was it was a great place to make money. But that that time may be gone. You know, 15, 20 years ago, um, it was really good in the winter. The game is tough. The, the betters are, are very sophisticated. The pools um, can be dominated by sophisticated money. Um, it doesn't make it any less interesting to handicap and try to figure out. But I think if you what I would suggest is what once again, it's always doing what works best for, for a certain individual. Yes. For me, I think you want to focus as much on one track as you can. You know, if you decide you like Maryland, focus on Maryland, or if it's California, focus on California. If it's New York, focus on New York. You know, be as adept at that place as you can be. But that's for me. Other people may see it very differently, and I will never argue with success. I may not agree with your method for getting there, but if somebody can prove to me that their method makes them successful, and I don't want to hear about I'm successful because I get a big rebate, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a different story, which is fine, by the way. I also have no problem with that, but is your handicapping that? Is it good or, you know, I don't know, you know, it's hard, but I, I, I for me, focusing on one track, you know, Got it. I've been centered, but, but it doesn't, you know, there's this notion that I don't follow or appreciate racing other jurisdictions. That's not true. But that's so not true. I spoke with you on the phone a couple of days ago and you're you're just you're all over the board. You're watching racing everywhere, but playing it, sticking to one track. Pretty I like that. Good. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I mean, and so, you know, you do so much work, obviously, but uh, 
average eight to nine race card, how long does it typically take you? You know, Saratoga, 10 race cards, um, five hours. Yeah. Aqueduct in the winter, two, two and a half. Yep. Okay. Um, something like that, you know, okay. um, it depends. Give All me right. more, you know. Um, I, I just printed up the last seven races at Oaklawn that I have to talk about on the show on Saturday and even doing a cursory amount of work on it, I'll be spending two hours on it. Just your most often wagers that you do play. I bet win. I bet win. I bet exactas. Um, I, I'll be honest with you. I do not bet pick fours and pick fives the way I used to mm -hmm. because I don't have the time that I did before because I'm on air so much to structure the tickets. So I honestly don't play them as much. Um, you know, um, people will note that I rarely put tickets up. I, when I play, I believe in playing multiple tickets. So I don't want to put up, if I put up a ticket, I'm going to bet my money on it. Um, but I would say it's, you know, the, probably win an exacta. Um, I'll bet some tries. I'll bet some pick fours, some pick fives, but it's spread out through there. But I'll bet, especially now, because I'm on the air, I bet a lot of win just to keep it simple because it's hard when you're on the, you know what I mean? It's like figuring out how I'm going to bet the race. Uh, it, it, I keep it much more simple. I'm not betting in the same way I used to because my duties are very different. Right. Which is fair enough. Okay. What's the best way for somebody who's watching you to play or use your daily selections? Well, I'd like to think, I mean, I wish that I mean, you can look at the selections on the website and I'm sure it's the same for you. Yeah. But I'd like to think the people who are going to bet them, some people should do whatever works for them. Some people just want your numbers. They don't care. That's fine. Right. Whatever makes you happy. You're the customer. Right. But I'd like to think they use them in a, in, along with being on television. Um, because I, I'd like to think that people that watch the show enough are able to tell when I'm more interested in betting a horse or a race than others. Right. Yeah. I, we're not going on TV and saying, I would never bet this race. <laughs> right so and the people right that think that we should are even more ridiculous in the suggestion <laughs> that we're wrong at doing that we work for the track we want people to bet let's not be we're not morons here but right. i'd like to think the way i talk about race i'm really excited I, i'm looking forward to betting this horse you know i'm not trying to beat the favorite you know whatever i, I you know but i'm gonna bet a you know i'm gonna bet an exactor with the, the four or second you know i'd like to think of talking horses I, I i make it fairly clear to people i think i do where i'm going in races and how i'm doing with them so you can't really get that from looking at my picks i have a good friend um who's an owner who would talk to me about that and he said i wish you could tear them in certain ways you know and, and put out different ways but it's, it's hard and i never really came down with a way to do that um so i'd like to think if people are interested in my selections they're hearing why and i also wish that people would listen to the show to listen to why because once again, they might not agree. They might just think, and, and you know what? They're probably going to be right that my opinion's not good because even when your opinions are good, they're more often wrong than right. <laughs> but I mean, things that make sense to me may not make sense to you and maybe for good reason. Um, but but, but you ultimately at the end of the day, take responsibility for your own bets. Don't blame you or me or anybody for not betting on a winner or for betting on a loser and don't give me credit or you credit for leaning us in a way because ultimately you want to be able to say you know what that person ma said made sense to me so therefore i made this decision that's what i i don't i don't need a pat on the back i really don't um the pat on the back is that people pay attention and they bet our races that that's the pat on the back and hopefully it works out for them and they enjoy themselves i think you know my I've used this line, and of course, it's been misinterpreted by, by, by people, but I, I see my job as trying to help people lose less. And by saying that is, this, the better your opinion, the more tough beats you're going to take. Because if you have a bad opinion, you're going to bet a lot of horses that are just going to run poor. <clears throat> so you're not going to take tough beats because your horses are always running sixth. As your opinion gets better, you're going to have more and more horses that are going to be in position to win races. <clears throat> so you're more and more likely to be the victim of the vagaries of racing. That's just an inevitable. So the better a handicapper you are, the more suffering you're going to have, right? Because the more lousy results, you know, it's like take an owner or a trainer. You would love to have a six to five shot or, or odds on in every stake race, but, and that's going to work out for you in the long run, but 
you're going to be a much more miserable when you lose that grade one with an even money shot than when you lose it with a 15 to one shot. 15 to one shot, you go, oh, we took a shot, you know, wow, we finished third. That was really great. Yeah. So it works both ways, right? You want to always have, you know, the, the, the odds to your advantage, but you're going to suffer more in those situations. You're alive in a pit for a score with it with a six to five shot and it loses. You're a lot more annoyed than you were alive with that 20 to one shot. You thought, you know what? I got where I wanted to get. I still know I'm probably not going to win, but I got where I wanted to get with the six to five. So you go, all right, this horse better win. I never win with these horses, right? You know, it's a completely different mentality. So, you know, I think that your enjoyment of the game will go up the better you handicap, the better you understand it because you'll, you know, the person, a person goes to track and makes terrible picks and their horse runs seven. They leave and think, what the hell was I doing there? You know, why did, but they go there, even if they don't win, but they had this 12 to one shot that ran second, was beaten ahead. They walk in and they, you know, that was frustrating, but I, I was going to win next time. And so I think the idea is if you make people more sophisticated and better, they'll enjoy their day more, win or lose, because they'll be in the game. more. And at the end of the day, I think we have to look at it I mean, yeah, people are trying to make money and that, and believe me, I take that seriously, but a lot of people go to the racetrack like they play golf, right? They don't expect to, to come out making a lot of money, but they'd like to be engaged, right? You're not going to keep playing golf if you keep shooting 60 over par, but if you, you know, you're, you're getting closer and you're in the hunt and you're having fun, it's going to be more fun. And I think that's what I'd hopefully make the track experience better by having people enjoy it more, by being more involved in a positive way. Absolutely. Words of wisdom for Andy Sterling. Andy, we're going to wrap it up okay. for us today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us at Learn Horse Racing. Uh, and we, uh, guys, thank you so much for joining us and see you again next time. Okay, so that was a tour de force by a legend in this game, showing you exactly how he does it. You just have to be impressed by the work and the time that goes into it and the institutional knowledge just gleaned from handicapping in detail thousands and thousands of races. So whether he's right or wrong or you agree or disagree with an opinion of his, you just can't argue with the work ethic, the skill and the passion he puts into it. And as you saw, there's nothing old fashioned about his techniques. For someone who's been handicapping for decades, he's also extremely current, taking full advantage of all the modern tools and features of products like DRF Formulator, Timeform US, and Replays, of course. Uh, so thanks again to the incredible Andy Serling, who was so generous sharing his ideas and methods with us. That really was a peek over the shoulder and inside the mind of the best in the business. Uh, this race we handicapped ended up having a few scratches, but his top pick untreated didn't win as an odds on favorite. Side, Pioneer Spirit closest to the rail. Here comes Untreated now to take the lead in deep stretch. Pioneer Spirit continues to battle, but it will be Untreated, who overcame that awkward beginning to win over Pioneer Spirit and by land and sea. Thanks for watching, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. That really, really helps us, and tell your friends about our show, and you can always find us at LearnHorseRacing.com. More amazing guests and shows coming soon. Thank you. The great Cassie's flattened out in third, and never, never more. Ice T in front from Sir Orinoco as they come to the 16th pole. Ali Francois with a right there and unspoken up on the inside. Unspoken's